And we're delighted to have with us this evening a scholar, historian, Carol Faulkner, who comes to us um, directly via the miracle of telecommunications. <clears throat> um, she, um, from Syracuse University, where she is the associate dean and a professor of history. She's also the interim chair of the Citizenship and Civic Engagement um, Program. And before I, I wanna say how wonderful it is to have her, and I'm going to give you a full introduction of her in a minute, but I want to also interrupt that to give you a little bit of a touch of local history because I feel that um, our topic, Lucretia Mott, is a woman of national and even international significance but as the Clinton Historical Society, um, I want you to have a little bit of grounding before we return to Carol and our formal introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen for just a minute and show you a couple of pictures. Oh, shit. <laughs> Why didn't it work? Oh, now you get to see my whole screen. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> You just want to uh, start the slideshow. There it is. There it is. Okay. And um, um, I wanted it to, whoops. Okay. I'm really bad. But anyway, Lucretia Mott spent her significant part of her childhood here in Dutchess County. Um, she was part of a congregation that was affiliated with the Nine Partners Meeting House in Millbrook, which of course is sort of the parent, the mother meeting to our own Creek meeting. And then of equal interest is the fact that she was a student at the Nine Partners Meeting House, which was um, at the Nine Partners Boarding School, which was affiliated with the Meeting House. So there's a 19th century view of this sadly gone today, but very impressive boarding house, which took in Quaker students from a broad regional area. So broad that one of the um, people who had his two daughters there is Elias Hicks, who was um, perhaps the best known of the traveling preachers of the era. And Elias Hicks, was a frequent visitor here in Dutchess County um, and had visited our own Creek Meeting House several times from, uh, from beginning in 1783, again in 1803, again in 1818, and again in 1829. And if you are not familiar with Elias Hicks, you should know that he is um, remembered in Quaker history as the man who really um, caused one of the two great schisms in the Society of Friends, he um, becoming the leader of what's known as the Hicksite faction. And the Hicksite faction believed in the purity of the inner light, as opposed to the folks who in our town um, ultimately started the Upton Friends Church across the road from the Creek Meeting House. And just to get a flavor of what he found when he came to the Creek Meeting House, on his first visit, he says, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. after this, we passed on attending meetings at Little Nine Partners and one at the house of our friend Tideman Hall, thence to the creek, where we had a precious opportunity on the first day of the week in a large meeting of friends and others. And um, then they went on to the Crumb Elbow and Oswego, and then we got on in time to Nine Partners to attend them, the preparative meetings. And he was um, very pleased and very impressed with his the time spent here at our own Creek meeting. So with that, I'm now going to go back to Carol. And um, I stopped sharing and I want to continue to introduce Carol because her, her, um, her background is very interesting and very pertinent. Um, she has a PhD from Binghamton University and specializes in 19th century America, US women, gender, sexuality, and social movements. Uh, she is the studies the history of the 19th century with a particular, I just read that. She is the author of three books, 
Women's Radical Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Aid Movement, Lucretia Mott, Lucretia Mott's Heresy, Abolition and Women's Rights in the 19th, in 19th Century America, which is the subject of tonight's talk, and Unfaithful Love, Adultery, and Marriage Reform in 19th Century America. She has many other um, publications to her credit, and she is also the co-editor of the Selected Letters of Lucretia Coffin Mott. She teaches classes on American social protest and the history of sexuality. And thus, with no further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to our distinguished guest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for the introduction. Thank you. Really happy to be here. I'm very impressed that you are all spending your Friday nights this way. It is, uh, it's great to see such a love of history. And um, I'm, I, I love Creek Meeting House. I've never seen an image of it before. And so that's a really spectacular meeting house. Um, and so I'll have to come see it in person one day. So I am going to uh, share my screen and can you all see that okay? Yeah, I can. All right, fantastic. Yes. Right, so I'm always delighted to speak about Lucretia Mott, the famous Quaker minister, abolitionist, and feminist. And in my presentation today, I'm going to discuss three main topics. Um, first, despite this uh, very benign image of a respectable Quaker lady, which Mott, of course, was to a certain extent, I'll explain that the title of my biography, Lucretia Mott's Heresy, directs us to Mott's radical confrontation with American views of race, religion, and women. Second, I'll give a short biographical sketch of Mott with a particular focus on her wide ranging activism leading up to the Seneca Falls Convention, the first women's rights convention um, solely devoted to women's rights in the country. And third, by examining her activities in the summer of 1848, I'll uh, suggest her distinctive contribution to the women's rights movement and to the Seneca Falls Convention as a link between women's rights and other national and international social and political movements. So I'm gonna start with the title, Lucretia Mott's Heresy. Her heresy was not simply religious, though it was that, merely by supporting the abolition of slavery and promoting women's rights, Mott defied a number of social and political orthodoxies in 19th century America. In addition, however, her radical views often set her apart from liberal-minded Quakers, as well as abolitionists and women's rights activists. And I wanna briefly mention her differences from these three cohorts. So first, after 1827, Mott was a member of a radical contingent of Quakers, uh, which Cynthia men mentioned, followers of minister Elias Hicks, who broke from the Society of Friends to protest the growing power of the Quaker leadership, their reliance on the Bible rather than the individual conscience as an authority, and their weak testimony against the institution of slavery. Yet even among so-called Hicksite Quakers, Mott was a controversial figure. In particular, her affiliation with radical abolitionists in William Lloyd Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society, which called for an immediate unconditional end to slavery, drew criticism from her co-religionists. And in fact, Mott, Mott was almost disowned from the Society of Friends because of her anti-slavery activities. Second, in the American Anti-Slavery Society, a group of ideologues, or as one critical newspaper editor referred to them, quote, non-resistance, infidels, socialists, atheists, grammites, pantheists, and all the disaffected materials afloat on the bosom of society, Mott stood out as morally uncompromising. Mott refused to buy or consume any goods produced by slaves, and she believed other abolitionists should do the same, and she was not afraid to tell them so. Though she was willing to help fugitive slaves on their journey, she opposed the purchase of slaves in order to free them, 
because she believed such actions acknowledged slavery's legitimacy. And when other abolitionists turned to party politics to solve the entrenched problem of slavery, Mott demurred. She viewed the American political system as fundamentally corrupted by its ties to slavery. All of these views brought her into conflict with her allies in the anti-slavery movement. And third, Mott's opposition to party politics also caused discord with fellow women's rights activists, most notably Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who saw women's right to vote as central to achieving other feminist goals. And I'll talk more about their uh, differences over the right to vote uh, when I get to the Seneca Falls Convention itself. More importantly, Mott saw women's rights and other social and political movements, such as anti-slavery, Indian reform, prison reform, temperance, peace, and democracy as interconnected. When, after the Civil War, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony broke with the anti-slavery movement over the relative priorities of Black male suffrage and women's suffrage, Mott objected to this false distinction among rights. And last, most certainly not least, Mott embraced the term heretic. Lucretia Mott declared that it was the obligation of reformers to quote, stand out in our heresy, to defy social norms, unjust laws, and religious traditions. Her choice of the physical verb to stand was deliberate. Mott rejected the idea that the peace testimony of the Society of Friends meant quietism. She told an audience of abolitionists that, quote, the early friends were agitators, disturbers of the peace, and she advised them to be equally obnoxious. And that's how I like to think of Mott as slightly obnoxious. Mott's willingness to claim the mantle of heretic then helps us understand her radicalism. She criticized American churches, including her own, for their elitism, their misguided traditions, and their failure to disavow slavery. Her uncompromising egalitarianism made her unusual, even among other abolitionists. And her commitment to abolition and racial equality over women's suffrage was unique among 19th century feminists. So next I'm gonna offer a brief overview of Mott's life and career up to the Seneca Falls Convention, of course, including her time at Nine Partners. And then I'll discuss her important contribution to the early women's rights movement, connecting women's rights to other social and political movements. So Lucretia Coffin was born in 1793 on the island of Nantucket. Her prominent Quaker family included the first white settlers on the island, and produced many other notable Americans like Patriot Benjamin Franklin and astronomer Mariah Mitchell. Her father, Thomas Coffin, was a whaling captain who dabbled in the China trade. And like many Nantucket women, her mother, Anna Folger Coffin, ran a small store and the household while her husband was at sea. And for those of you who have been to Nantucket, you know there's a, a street um, on the island still called Petticoat Lane in honor of these women who owned um, all their, operated their own businesses. In 1804, the Coffins moved to Boston and they soon sent Lucretia to a Quaker boarding school called Nine Partners. The school was founded by the radical preacher Elias Hicks and her future grandfather-in-law, educator James Mott. And it was a project of the New York Yearly Meeting, which was why uh, Elias Hicks and James Mott were involved. The Society of Friends had rejected slavery as sinful at the end of the 18th century, and Quaker education instructed children in anti-slavery ideas. At boarding school, Lucretia used a natural history textbook by Priscilla Wakefield that taught that it was evil to consume goods produced by slaves a lesson that she kept with her um, for the rest of her life. The famous illustration of the cruelly overcrowded slave ship Brooks adorned the wall. At Nine Partners, she memorized the didactic poems of William Cowper, an Englishman, including one called 
the quote, Negro's complaint, which began, forced from home and all its pleasures, Africa's coast I left forlorn to increase a stranger's treasures or the raging billows born. Um, and she sort of shared this analysis of slavery as rooted in greed. Eventually, Lucretia became a teacher in the school and later married her fellow teacher, James Mott. And here is a picture of the happy couple. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about their marriage. I know they don't look particularly happy uh, in that picture, but that's the 19th century for you. Um, they actually had a very long and happy um, marriage. They were married for over um, 50 years when James died. Um, Lucretia could no longer sleep in the bed that she had shared with him. Um, and I've only found two things that they ever disagreed on, um, which I'm happy to talk about uh, in the Q&A. Um, one was free produce, so the, the boycott of slave-produced goods, and the other uh, was Abraham Lincoln. After the couple moved to Philadelphia in 1811, Mott taught in a Quaker school while starting her family. And she eventually had six children, five of whom lived to adulthood. In 1821, she became an approved minister in the Society of Friends. And those of you who um, know about the Society of Friends, you know that there's no formal ministry in the Society of Friends. There's no going to school to get a degree to become a minister you have a calling that is recognized by your peers. So you basically have a gift for preaching. And if you have, are especially talented at preaching, as Lucretia Mott was, you become a traveling minister. So you travel from your own meeting to other meetings around the country, which of course Lucretia did throughout her career. As a preacher, Mott was a forceful advocate for the views of Nine Partners founder, Elias Hicks a New York minister who criticized Quaker elders for invoking biblical authority to suppress the consciences of their fellow friends. Hicks believed these leaders had become complacent in their testimony against slavery. In particular, he criticized their willingness to trade with slaveholders, to do business with slaveholders and otherwise condone the practice. Hicks called upon friends to return to the original principle of the inward light, which stated that every human being had the ability to know God. As I mentioned before, his ministry led to a schism in the Society of Friends in 1827, and Mott and the majority of Quakers in Philadelphia formed the Hicksite Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, and the opposed were known as the Orthodox uh, Quakers. Mott emerged from the Hicksite split, a committed abolitionist and racial egalitarian. In 1833 in Philadelphia, she attended the founding meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society. And soon after, literally days after, uh, she and other white and black women formed the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society. The constitution of the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, as it's known, declared that slavery and racial prejudice were contrary to the laws of God and the principles set forth in the Declaration of Independence. PFAS became the longest lived female anti-slavery society in the country, finally closing its doors in 1870 after the passage of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Significantly, the organization was interracial for all 37 years. By the time Mott traveled to London for the World's Anti-Slavery Convention in 1840, her reputation as a minister and abolitionist had grown. In Great Britain, she addressed large audiences, including 500 spectators in London and 300 in Dublin. In the British Isles, she also met with writer Harriet Martineau, reformer Lady Byron, the Scottish phrenologist George Combe, and Irish emancipator Daniel O'Connell, among others. And in London, Lucretia Mott also met a young American woman named Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And before I get into the um, uh, friendship between Stanton and Mott, I just want to briefly talk about this uh, amazing painting of the World's Anti-Slavery Convention. 
um, you can see that there are women in the painting. So Thomas Clarkson is the man standing up and speaking. He's a very famous, was a very famous British abolitionist. His daughter-in-law is seated right behind him. Um, sit, seated in the audience, you can see several women. Uh, the woman in the fabulous um, black hat is uh, uh, Lady Byron. But Mott is not in the picture even though James is. And both went to Benjamin Robert Hayden's studio and sat for the painter. And he, so he painted, he did, you know, sample drawings of both for the larger, for the larger painting. But he, um, Mott is actually one of the blurry figures in the way back behind the sort of red bar. So seated, seated in the, in the cheap seats, basically. Uh, and he said um, of Lucretia Mott, I will save that spot um, for someone who's a beautiful believer in the divinity of Christ, basically identifying her as a heretic, right? And saying, you know, only, only women who, who believe in, in, in Christ. And he didn't think the, the Hicksite Quakers did. Um, so in the history of woman suffrage, published by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage in 1881. Uh, this, this history of the women's rights movement dates the origins of the movement, both in England and America, to the world's anti-slavery convention. It's unsurprising that Stanton and her collaborators would mark the convention as significant. The conference was a pivotal moment in Stanton's life for three reasons. First, she attended the meeting as her honeymoon after marrying abolitionist Henry Stanton, with whom she bore seven children. Second, at the convention, she met Lucretia Mott for the first time, and Stanton saw Mott as a role model for the rest of her days. She called her a revelation of womanhood. And then third, as I mentioned, according to the history of women's suffrage, the conference's refusal to seat the American female delegates provoked Stanton and Mott to call a women's rights convention when they returned to the United States. And um, the quote on the slide is from the history of women's suffrage. As Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton wended their way arm in arm down Great Queen Street that night, reviewing the exciting scenes of the day, they agreed to hold a women's rights convention on their return to America as the men to whom they had just listened had manifested their great need of some education on that question. And historians have generally accepted that this conversation occurred and acknowledge the convention as an essential moment on the road to Seneca Falls. Yet Mott did not record the conversation in her diary or indeed any conversation with Stanton on women's rights. They had lots of conversations. They talked about religion, they talked about education, they did not talk about women's rights, nor did Mott's husband James mention it in his account of their journey three months in Great Britain. Despite their immediate sense of connection, Mott and Stanton viewed the world's anti-slavery convention from different perspectives. Mott attended as a committed abolitionist and the female leader of the American anti-slavery delegation. In other words, the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, the American Anti-Slavery Society, and I think even one other anti-slavery organization had all uh, elected Mott as a delegate to officially represent them in London. Um, but as a woman, she was not seated at the convention. Mott saw anti-slavery and women's rights as part of the same reform impulse to liberate the individual from the bonds of tradition, custom, and established religion. And at the world's anti-slavery convention, her priority was the struggle against slavery. For Stanton, however, the convention illustrated the need for a women's movement that was separate and independent of any other social movement. Eight years later at Seneca Falls, these strategic tensions remained. Should the women's rights movement ally with other movements for social justice? What was the relationship between women's rights and the struggle for racial equality? The Seneca Falls Convention, as I'm sure you all know, was held July 19th and 20th, 1848. And significantly, the convention occurred at that moment and in that place 
in part because Mott was traveling in central and western New York that summer. Mott's travels in 1848, particularly in the period immediately preceding the Seneca Falls Convention, demonstrate her understanding of the interconnections between national and global movements for equal rights, abolition, religious freedom, native rights, and political independence. Mott's first stop was Genesee Yearly Meeting, an annual gathering of Quakers from across the region held at the Farmington Meeting House. And you can see that um, in the lower left. That's how I'm looking. It might be your lower right, but on the slide. Um, with strong echoes of the earlier Hicksite schism, Genesee Yearly Meeting split with Mott's allies, led by Thomas McClintock, pro protesting the spirit of intolerance that limited Quakers' individual right to protest things like war, slavery, intemperance, and other wrongs. The separatists also advocated equality in the human family, ending the tradition of hierarchy between men's and women's meetings in the Society of Friends. Next, Mott and other members of the Joint Indian Committee traveled to the Cattaraugus Reservation. Quakers, um, and this was a, a joint um, partnership between Pennsylvania Quakers, New York Quakers, um, and Massachusetts Quakers. Um, the Joint Indian Committee had been formed in 1838 after the Ogden Land Company forced Seneca Indians to sign the Treaty of Buffalo Creek, removing them to Indian territory, so removing them to the West. By 1842, Mott and the Joint Indian Committee had helped negotiate a supplemental treaty, which allowed the Seneca to remain in New York, but at great cost. The Seneca retained control of two reservations, the Allegheny and the Cattaraugus, ceding the Buffalo Creek and Tonawanda reservations to the Ogden Land Company. In 1848, as Lucretia observed, the Seneca were seeking, and this is her words, larger liberty, more independence. The Seneca chafed at the leadership of the chiefs who had negotiated the Treaty of Buffalo Creek. And in 1845, they had decreed that the approval of two thirds of an assembly of chiefs and warriors and two thirds of the adult male population was necessary for any land sale. The Seneca Nation's 1848 constitution confirmed these changes by creating an elected body of leaders. And they were in the process of writing that constitution when Mott visited in the summer of 1848. But Lucretia Mott was ambivalent about the impact of Quaker involvement on Seneca women. In 1839, when the Indian Committee discussed what they perceived as the sad state of things among Seneca women, Lucretia suggested that Seneca women, in her words, a council of squaws, be consulted. Though her use of the term squaw revealed condescending assumptions about Indian women, she saw the imposition of Victorian domestic ideals as heavy handed. Other Quakers dismissed her comments and in 1847, one year before the Seneca Falls Convention, the joint committee advised the Seneca that quote, no community can be virtuous and happy which is not chastened by the controlling example of female delicacy and refinement. From Cattaraugus, Mott went to visit a second group, former slaves living in the province of Ontario, nicknamed at that time Canada West. Since the British had abolished slavery throughout their empire in 1833, Canada had become an important destination for fugitives from the United States. By the time Mott visited, approximately 12,000 former slaves had settled there. Lucretia declared it worth a journey of many miles to see the colored man a man. She held meetings with self-emancipated slaves, her term, in Chatham, Don, London, and Toronto. She described their cheerful toil, their efforts to educate their children, and their hospitality. Her attention to their hospitality was important. Urging fugitives onward, Lucretia wrote, quote, the spirit of freedom is arousing the world. Mott's conception of this international movement, as well as her immediate experiences at Genesee Yearly Meeting, Cattaraugus, and Ontario, 
shaped her perspective on the Seneca Falls Convention. Significantly, Mott was not the only reformer in Western New York staking a broad claim to radicalism. While Mott was visiting Farmington, Cattaraugus, and Ontario, Garrett Smith and other political abolitionists gathered in Buffalo for the National Liberty Convention. Smith's faction, and uh, Garrett Smith is um, uh, uh, the white man, Smith's faction of the uh, anti-slavery political party, the Liberty Party, was known as the Liberty League and argued that slavery was unconstitutional. In their founding convention the previous year, the Liberty League had nominated Garrett Smith for president in an election that included women. Lucretia Mott had received one vote, as had Lydia Mariah Child. At the National Liberty Convention in June 1848, so about a month before the Seneca Falls Convention, the interracial platform included Frederick Doug Douglass, um, pictured on the slide, Minister Henry Highland Garnett, and newspaper editor Samuel Ringold Ward. At the meeting, Garrett Smith expressed his support for, quote, universal suffrage in its broadest sense, females as well as males being entitled to vote. This time, Lucretia Mott received five votes for the League's nomination as president. If she was aware of this uh, nomination, she did not comment. Despite her distrust of party politics, she may have appreciated this show of support in the fight for abolition and racial and sexual equality. Um, after leaving Ontario, Lucretia Mott headed to Auburn, New York, which was the home of her sister Martha, Martha Coffin Wright. Um, and many of you may have seen the new book by Dorothy Wickenden um, that is about uh, Harriet Tubman, Francis Seward, because William Seward is all from, also from Auburn, uh, and Martha Coffin Wright, Lucretia Mott's um, sister. It's called The Agitators. Uh, the two sisters attended the legendary tea party at Jane Hunt's home in nearby Waterloo, where Mott Wright Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Jane Hunt, and Marianne McClintock decided to call a convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition of women. But Mott was in Auburn, which was about a train ride away from Seneca Falls, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Marianne McClintock, and McClintock's two adult daughters drafted the convention's Declaration of Sentiments. While the other women conferred in McClintock's home, Mott preached to prisoners at Auburn State Penitentiary and parishioners at the city's Universalist Church. From Auburn, Mott also wrote to Stanton asking, quote, are you going to have any reform or other meeting during the sittings of the convention? The response from Stanton was silence. Three days later, the convention attracted approximately 300 men and women from around the region, including Frederick Douglass, who had attended the National Liberty Convention. From the beginning, the matter of defining women's rights presented a problem. Recall Mott's and Stanton's experiences at the world's anti-slavery convention. Should men participate in a movement for women's rights? Should they sign their name to the Declaration of Sentiments? After an animated discussion, the answer was yes. James Mott, Lucretia's husband, chaired the convention on the second day, and 32 men signed their names to the Declaration of Sentiments. Mott offered a resolution in support of the participation of men, resolved that the speedy success of our cause depends on the zealous and untiring efforts of both men and women. This resolution shows Mott's commitment not only to unity of action, but the accordance of different reform movements. Historian Judith Wellman has suggested that the debates at the Seneca Falls Convention reflected a split not only within the convention as a whole, but more particularly between Stanton and Mott, and I agree. The Declaration of Sentiments reveals little of Mott's influence. And despite the fact that she addressed the convention more than any other speaker, only a few of her remarks were actually recorded in the convention's proceedings. Notably, Mott urged a large audience at the end of the first day to consider women's rights as one aspect of reforms in general. That's all we know of what she said, reforms in general. This belief that women's rights were one element of a broader reform impulse 
helps explain her absence. While Stanton and the McClintocks famously based their document on Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, all men and women are created equal, Mott criticized Jefferson's truths as anything but self-evident. She preferred the American Anti-Slavery Society's declaration, which simply stated that every man has a right to his own body and that no man has a right to enslave or imbrute his brother. Likewise, Mott's contempt for party politics, which she viewed as a form of intellectual slavery, explains her doubts about women's suffrage. At the Seneca Falls Convention, when Stanton proposed that an essential element of man's tyranny over woman was that he had denied her right to the franchise, Mott responded, Lizzie, thou wilt make the convention ridiculous. Um, but she wasn't worried about being ridiculed um, by the press or by the American public, and her, her remarks are often interpreted that way. What she really meant was, was other reformers are going to think that our convention is ridiculous. We're non-resistance. We don't participate in politics. We view it as corrupted by slavery. Um, the right to vote is not, not worthy of our efforts. Years later, Mott wrote Stanton, perhaps with some disappointment. I have never liked the undeserved praise of being the moving spirit of that occasion when to thyself belongs the honor aided so efficiently by the McClintocks. In a letter written shortly after the Seneca Falls Convention, um, this is her What I Did Last Summer letter, Mott described her visits to Cattaraugus, to Canada West, and her attendance at women's rights conventions in Seneca Falls and Rochester, New York. In the letter, she urged fellow activists to share her view that, quote, all these subjects of reform are kindred in their nature and giving to each its proper consideration will tend to strengthen and nerve the mind for all. Mott envisioned women's rights not as a new and separate movement, but rather as an extension of the universal principles of liberty and equality. Mott's perspective linking women's rights to national and international movements against slavery, capitalism, and empire remained a powerful, if contested, current in the 19th century women's rights movement. By her death in 1880, Mott's controversial views on religion, race, and women's rights had become more acceptable, a fact that contributes to her benevolent image. At the end of 1848, however, Lucretia had written that, quote, it seems as though a new era is breaking in upon us, commenting on the revolutions in Europe, the slavery and peace question, agitation in all the churches, and the enlargement of women's sphere, Mott observed, quote, we can but hope for some mighty overturning. Mott's perspective reminds us that the Seneca Falls Convention was a revolutionary moment in a year of local and global uprisings. And Lucretia Mott, as the representative of an international community of activists dedicated to overthrowing traditional authority, was one of its leading radicals. Thank you very much for listening. 